Welcome, this is Najma Minhas with GVS Dialogue. We thanks for joining me today. As you know, Iran, Iran has launched unprecedented direct attacks on Israel in response to the, Iran, uh, to the um, Israeli attack on the Iranian consulate in Damascus, Syria. They've launched over 200 drones and missiles by now. Why do you think Iran had to do this now? I think in the first place, uh, it's important to emphasize that this is not actually an attack on Israel. It's actually Iran has exercised its right under the international law for a counter strike. Because what Israel did deliberately, uh, without any necessary provocation, on 1st of April 2024, a strike, uh, which was clearly an Israeli strike in a second country, Damascus, on a third country's uh, soil presence, because according to the international law, the embassies and consulates and missions are considered the sovereign territory. So what they, it struck the Iranian embassy in Damascus was not even Syria. So they have struck inside Syria, but they have struck on Iran, which is the uh, which is the sovereign territory and soil. Embassies are sovereign territories. So of course, Israelis are not kids. They do not are they not children. They have deliberately provoked Iran. This is the point one. And, the, and there is no explanation. Israel, whenever Israel strikes anywhere, they never comment on that. When the questions were asked from the Israeli uh, Ministry of Defense and spokesperson, they said we never comment on the international developments or developments reported. They haven't the acknowledged media. the strike as being theirs. Yeah, it is not only this case. What I'm explaining is this, that Israel has done several strikes in Iraq and Syria and different places, but they have never accepted those. They never comment on those. But it's always understandable at the same time the Israeli officials always speak with international media, especially New York Times and the American media. And in this case, the New York Times reported that four separate uh, Israeli officials on condition of anonymity that remain unnamed had confirmed to New York Times that Israel has struck because a meeting was taking place between the Palestinians and the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps in which two, seven, uh, you know, uh, seven officials of uh, Iran were killed, including two senior officials, which are brigadier generals. One was uh, uh, Zahidi, uh, I think was Raza Zahidi, and the second was General General Hadi. So Iranian ambassador at the time had struck that, you know, we'll definitely respond. And then Ayatollah Ali Khamenei said that we'll respond. But it's important, Najma, it's very important to understand this thing, that this is not something that has, um, uh, that just happened, it's, or it's an organic development, or it's an accident. Uh, Israel has definitely, the Prime Minister Netanyahu has definitely provoked Iran. Uh, it hasn't left any option for Iran not to respond. I mean, many people who are not uh, aware of the dynamics of the international relations, they might actually be innocent enough to think that, you know, uh, Iran has now provoked Israel and the West and United States and uh, Iran should not, uh, should have just been lying low and should not have provoked Israel. For Iran, it was very important to establish a level of deference. And that is why Iran has struck with two uh, cruise, 36 missiles, 185 uh, drones, uh, which were the uh, autonomous drones, uh, and probably two ballistic missiles. It is, in fact, to show, I think Iran is ready for an Iran, for Israeli reaction as well. And what Iran wanted to show to the United States and to Israel, that, you know, you are risking a larger war in the Middle East and we're not going to take it and you cannot really attack our sovereign territory like this. Because if Iran would not respond, that means Israel and the United States, I mean, they have actually tested Iran's resolve over here. And Iran has taken 12 days. You know, it's the 13th day on which it has struck. And my understanding is this, that it has conferred with its allies. So this matter must have been discussed with the Russians and with the Chinese uh, as to how we have to take a position. You say that the Iranians had to respond, but... In 1998, there was an incident in which the Taliban attacked the Iranian consulate in Mazar-e Sharif in Afghanistan. And at the time that the Iranians were thinking of attacking, except there was a United Nations Security Council, um, which actually talked about the fact that Afghanistan should not have done this. So couldn't Iranians have done something similar to that? I mean, what, what do you think? Could they not have waited? Or, I mean, what are your thoughts on something like that happening this time. It's a, it's a, it's a good example uh, of digging down in the past. Uh, I clearly remember that Iran has ordered general mobilization. Uh, it had almost gone to the uh, to the edge of declaring war. On, uh, it was threatening a direct attack on the Afghan Taliban Afghanistan, and it had moved its troops to the forward positions. Mm -hmm. Then Afghan Taliban were very conciliatory. 
the Afghan Taliban, you know, there was hectic diplomacy in which number of countries were involved, including Pakistan. And the Afghan Taliban were very conciliatory. They were basically, uh, you know, behind the scenes, they were basically asking for their, they were conveying their, you know, regrets and their apologies. And then uh, United Nations Security Council, United Nations was also involved into it. So other countries, over here, look what happens. Uh, Israel does crosses the red line. Uh, Israel deliberately attacks Iranian soil, that is Iranian embassy, kills uh, senior Iranian officials without any clear reason to basically say they were doing a meeting and Israel had for threatened is total nonsense. So Israel provoked them and none of the Israeli allies, neither you referring to uh, United Nations Security Council, but look at the responses from United States, from Britain, from France, from Germany, none of the countries comes forward and basically says that Israel has done something which it hasn't done. And there was a lukewarm reaction. Mm -hmm. So Iran, uh, if if there was any international reaction, if Iran, if Israel would have shown regrets that, you know, it didn't mean to kill people, uh, it was an accident, it was misled intelligence and blah, 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 or, you know, Israel will look into it as to how it happened, then Iran would not, so Iran would, have, would not have gone to the extent because Iran is in no mood, uh, in no position uh, to afford a war with uh, Israel or with the United, uh, with the United States or with the Western allies. But Iran has been compelled. So if Iran would not respond, that means Israel can treat Iran uh, in the same way uh, as it has been treating Syria or Iraq. So you're saying basically that had the United Nations Security Council condemned Israel for violating under the Vienna Convention Iranian territory in Damascus, Iran would not have been compelled to do this, what it did today. I think so, because if you look at the uh, the buildup of all this till the 13th of April, um, uh, is United States has been calling, but once the Iran basically said that it, 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 it will definitely respond to it, when once Ayatollah Ali Khamenei said this thing, that United States involved several countries. It involved Saudi Arabia, it involved Oman, it involved uh, Qatar, it involved UAE, I think it involved Egypt. And all these countries, and then, you know, the Germany basically took a position. Russia also said that Iran should not, uh, you know, respond. Uh, United States went up to the extent that the Secretary of State, Tony Blinken, actually called upon the Chinese foreign minister and said that, you know, Iran should be persuaded not to, or should be convinced not to react. So Iran, uh, according to one story in the New York Times, which was also produced, I think, uh, in the Israeli uh, newspapers, I think I've seen that uh, in, in one of the Israeli papers, is that Iran conveyed through Oman that it doesn't want escalation, but it has to respond, but it will respond in a fashion that will not be escalatory. And if you look at the nature of the attack, which the Iranians have done, uh, on one side for public consumption, for the Muslim world to see, for the Palestinians, because Iran also, Iran has to cater to a number of, uh, a number of its own audiences. The audience of Iran's action uh, is not only inside Iran. Yes, the Iranian public is the audience, but Palestinians are the audience, the Arab street is the audience, the Muslim world is the audience, right? So uh, if uh, on New York Times, you can actually see that these uh, Iranian uh, projectiles are passing over uh, the whole of Palestine. They're passing over West Bank, Hebron, Jerusalem. And you can hear the thunder and the shouts of Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. And these thunder and shouts are not coming from the Iranians. These are actually coming uh, coming from the Palestinians, you know, because these are low-lying uh, projectiles. So wh while the number of the projectiles are more than 200, uh, first of all, I mean, they have taken, they have used slow moving projectiles, right? In a sense that, uh, and then once they issuing the projectiles, it was not necessarily a great uh, work of science on part of the uh, Israelis to detect that. The Islamic Revolutionary Corps Guard uh, basically announced that. They made a statement that we have issued uh, these, you know, we have launched these drone strikes. So, it, and then Israelis at the time said that it's going to take the a few hours. The the Iranians were making. No, no, let me complete this. It's very important. Let me complete this. So Iran actually gave them number of hours, so say two to three hours advance notice, so that the Israelis can uh, very, could very easily see the uh, the direction of these projectiles and and also look at this: what were these projectiles carrying? These three hundred, these two hundred or three hundred projectiles, if they were really carrying uh, heavy explosives, then they would have been a serious not only the human loss, but there could have been material loss inside Israel. But as we now know, that there has not been much of a material loss. So, so Iran has actually. So responded. does that mean then Iran has not been successful, or does that mean this was a deliberate policy by Iran? Because, for example, during the call that Biden and Netanyahu had, one of the readouts suggests that. Biden also said to Netanyahu that he should see this as a win because there hasn't been any particular major loss of uh, casualties. Yeah, I mean, if this is true, I have read this, uh, but you see the Biden administration could be very duplicitous over here. 
Uh, they could be uh, they could be saying one thing and meaning the other because I uh, that's very true uh, that it's quoted in New York Times and other publications and it's on the Twitter as well that President Biden has counseled Netanyahu and has said that look your defenses have really worked and it's also true that President Biden has also mentioned uh, the from the from the readout that you know look at the U.S. and the U.K. Uh, forces have also played a role uh, in in stopping the Iranian missiles and the Iranian projectiles or the or the Iranian uh, you know the drones. So it looks like as if the American president is counseling the Israeli prime minister that look you don't need to respond uh, anymore because your defenses have worked. You don't really have any material damage. But you know I suspect that the decision. Uh, the the uh, the, uh, the the radical decision, the dangerous decision uh, of attacking the uh, Iranian consulate at the embassy and killing the Iranian senior officials in Damascus could not have been the decision of Prime Minister Netanyahu alone. My suspicion is this. No, but uh, the, uh, the United States is saying they did, they had no heads up on that particular attack. Well, see, United States will always says that. Uh, I doubt that. I doubt that because it's a very big decision, you know. So, and they've also asked that if Israel does anything right now with regard to Iran, they should be given the heads up. You see, uh, looking at the Israel, United States and Middle Eastern relationship for the past number of years and all moments of crisis, United States makes very... Uh, cautious statements, but in the end, it's always standing by Israel. Mm -hmm. So could Netanyahu, so there could be two options, let's put it with two options that Netanyahu is bold enough, audacious enough, confident enough, that he wants to basically bring Iran into a war situation with Israel. And he's very confident that once I finger Iran, and once I create a situation like this, United States and the West will have no option but to stand with me, and I can open up a larger front, because he desperately wants to avoid election inside Israel. Mm -hmm. um, and if you'll ask me, I'll explain to you the kind of is that why do you think why do, is that why he is he attacked Iran? Do you think? You see, look, you have to understand what is the context of all this. So Biden administration was desperate that the war in Gaza should end. Netanyahu was, on the other hand, desperate and determined that war should not end till at least the American election, and he wanted to prolong uh, for two reasons. You know, first of all, he wanted to emerge victorious from the war. He has killed almost 34,000 Palestinians, mostly young children and you know women as well. Uh, but his two goals were that he would be able to use the Israeli Defense Forces to release all the hostages. He will bring such pressure on Hamas that he will be able to militarily, and in a much fuller fashion, release the hostages. And the second was that he said that uh, he, he was he was committed to the Israeli people that he will lead to the total eradication of Hamas. He kept on saying it again and again that all these demands from United States and the West or United Nations, you know, the Secretary General is actually betraying Israel. Even I mean, the Secretary General was declared anti anti Semite, you know, at one point by the Israeli ambassador to the United Nations. So the goal was this: that we will bring the hostages back through muscular military pressure. And secondly, for once and all, we will eradicate Hamas, uh, you know, from the Palestinian land will totally destroy the Hamas's, you know, military ability or organizational ability. Both things have not happened. The Israeli Defense Forces have been on, only able to rescue two, two Israeli hostages from Hamas. The rest of the 100 plus were actually released through a process of protracted and sustained negotiation in which United States, Qatar, Egypt, and the other countries played a role. Uh, and the Hamas still stands there. I mean, if you look till the last moment, uh, all the uh, American and the Israeli officials are convinced that Hamas is still intact as a as an organization. I mean, so much so, not only this, that, you know, probably 100,000 uh, kilograms of bombs have been thrown onto a small um, uh, landmass of Gaza, which is only five miles wide and is like 40, uh, 25, uh, 25 miles long, 40 kilometers long. But I mean, it's not only the bombing. Uh, it's not only the bombing. The Israeli Defense Forces went in. They occupied the whole of Gaza. I mean, for the several weeks, you know, for months, uh, and they went up to Rafah. But even then, they have not been able to destroy. I mean, at one point, they started bringing in the sea water, you know, and then it also didn't work. So they couldn't penetrate the tunnel system. They couldn't rescue the hostages. And now the American sources are saying that. I mean, they think that. Most of the hostages are dead anyway. So Netanyahu has no face left. I mean, he had created a war cabinet after 7th October. Uh, and now, under the American pressure and the Western pressure, because of what South Africa did in the International Court of Justice, Netanyahu has been forced to pull back. Uh, I mean, the war had entered a total stage of futility. 
uh, what you call in economics is, uh, you know, dwindling returns. There were no real returns of this war, you know, apart from killing another 100 people every day. So most of the Israeli forces, my understanding is that they have been pulled out of Gaza. The intense bombing still continues. But Israel had no more point of continuing the war. So what has Netanyahu gained out of it? He has not been able to declare that Hamas has been destroyed. He has not been able to get the hostages back. The Israeli public is very upset. His war cabinet has to end up. He has to hold elections. I mean, how will he go into the elections? Top so American wanted... uh, Democrats have even asked for him to step aside and have elections in the country, which is, you know, it's unprecedented for someone like Chuck Schumer, a uh, leading Democrat, to actually ask for him to resign and to have elections in the country. I saw the statement, you know, so the Democratic Party is totally fractured at the moment. I mean, we have seen that what happened in primaries, right. in Democratic so you, primaries. So you're saying, in essence, that he is trying to avoid having elections and therefore being defeated. And that's why he wants to expand this war um, and take it to Iran. Definitely. The other purpose could be, the other goal could be, the other argument, which if you haven't read, you will soon find it being mentioned is that, you know, uh, whatever happened on October 7th, behind Hamas, there was only one Middle Eastern power, and that was Iran. And even today, the letter that has been sent by Israel's uh, ambassador uh, to the president of the Security Council of the Gen or the Security Council, Ms. Vanessa, uh, if you read that article, it basically says that Iran has been supporting all these jihadist organizations, the, the Islamic militant groups and Hamas and so on. So the argument which Israel and even the Americans can sell is this, that, you know, uh, uh, confronting Iran is very important because Iran, because and then, you know, in, in, in terms of the desire to confront Iran, you look, there is a, a behind the scenes, you fully understand that uh, all the Arab countries, which are allies of now Israel and long-standing allies of United States, like Saudi Arabia, UAE, Oman, Qatar, they all are actually afraid of Iran. Uh, and if you go back in the history, which most people do not remember very well, I mean, in the past, uh, you know, I mean, Iranian uh, Persian Empire is very old. But if you look at the past 500, 600 years, the Muslim powers in the region uh, were Iran, were Iraq, were Syria, for the Ottomans and the Turks, and all these new uh, Arab kingdoms and the states, which are now very important uh, from the Western point of view. I mean, these are artificial tin pot republics like UAE, Qatar, Oman, uh, and Saudi Arabia. I mean, who cares for Hejaz? Throughout the Muslim history, uh, if you look, the Hejaz has been totally insignificant. It's only in the middle of uh, 20th century from 1930 onwards that uh, Saudi Arabia and Hejaz uh, have assumed importance because of the American relationship and because of the oil. Otherwise, uh, Hejaz, Oman, uh, UAE, Qatar, Bahrain, I mean, all these have no role, no history, no presence, no citation, no mention in a Muslim history. Yeah. Muslim history uh, of the powers that mattered in the region were Syria, were Iraq, uh, Iran and, and Turkey. So all of these powers have been displaced. So the only real power that is actually pitched against Israel at the moment is Iran. So there is also a desire to basically what neutralize What do you make it. of the Saudi Arabia um, calling for restraint from all sides, the statement that the Saudi Arabians gave? Yeah, hypocrisy, nothing else. I mean, Saudi Arabia and UAE are just hypocrisy. I mean, they're very pro-Israel. They see their relationship with Israel. Uh, Pakistan has given no statement so far. I mean, would you have expected anything stronger from Pakistan? I mean, the if, Indians have, have made a similar um, statement saying that we exercise, we urge all, pa all parties involved to exercise restraint. What would you have expected it, from the Pakistani government? In, in, India has its own, uh, from the early 1990s, India has its own relationship with Israel. And before early 1990s, India used to take a more stronger and robust position on the Middle Eastern affairs, which was, also, which was almost always slightly partial towards the Arabs because of its relationship in the Arab capitals. Uh, but now it has softened its position on Israel. Pakistan would have taken a very strong position had it been not the present kind of um, under siege government for strategic reasons and for you know for the economic reasons and for the its total dependence on uh, on the Western support through IMF and World Bank and United States and Washington giving it legitimacy from the outside. The Pakistani present Pakistani government has no internal legitimacy, so it derives all its legitimacy from the uh, from the Western governments from Washington, London, and from European Union. So uh, had it not been the case, had it been the previous governments either of Nawaz Sharif or Imran Khan in a different situation, they would have taken a very strong position uh, in favor of Iran and against Israel. What would they have said? I they think they would have they, they would have, have gone and said no. that they condemn Israel's actions on when Iran is the one provoking in this particular case, um, since Iran was the one launching. No, but Iran, no, no, but that's very important to understand. You know, see, uh, uh, Iran is not the one who has provoked Israel. No, Israel has that. taken of Israel course. has taken the step. 
No, Israel has taken the step. Right. Uh, and on the, on the, on all... the 1st of April, I can imagine that the Pakistanis would have given a strong rebuking uh, to Israel uh, uh, for undertaking that particular, um, for attacking the Iranian consulate. But today, for example, when Iran has launched unprecedented attack on Israel, what would the Pakistanis Pakistan would have asked for restraint? Today? But you see, had it been the old Pakistan, this new Pakistan post April 2022 is a very weak Pakistan on the international stage. Had it been the old Pakistan that existed before 10th April 2022, Pakistanis have diplomats have been very good in moving across the United Nations Security Council, General Assembly, and all that. Pakistanis have always been building coalitions for the Arab world, for the Palestinian cause. I mean, it would have gone and created havoc in the United Nations. Had it been the old Pakistan, mm -hmm. the Pakistan that existed uh, before 10th April 2022. So Pakistan has totally lost its position uh, on the international stage. It has no position uh, at all at mm. the moment. Mm. Another interesting thing that people are pointing out is that Iran, by doing this at this point in time, has taken the bait from Israel. And whereas Israel was looking more like an aggressor at this point, and the Palestinian cause was being highlighted, by attacking Isra Israel in this, in this manner, 200 drones and missiles, has made Israel look more like a victim. I mean, only yesterday, I think it was this, may, it may have even been this morning, the New York Times editorial board actually said that Biden administration needs to be having ties, um, tying conditions to the military aid that's given to Israel. Now, literally on the day that they've done this, Iran has attacked Israel, and therefore Israel has come across as a victim. So what advantage has this been for the Palestinian cause, even though they were celebrating, as you mentioned, in Jerusalem? Oh, well, the celebrating is an emotional thing. Um, I don't fully understand and assess at this moment uh, the effect on the Palestinian cause, apart from the fact that they think that not alone. Uh, I was in a New York uh, coffee place when I first saw the developments, and I did an Urdu quick vlog about 10 minutes. And at the time, there were other people in that uh, in that coffee place. And uh, once I was telling the, the the coffee shop guy that, you know, look, I'm reporting a vlog, you know, uh, uh, the other people over, overheard me. I was the first person who knew uh, that Iran has actually sent missiles and, you know, the um, the drones into Israel. And these were mainstream Americans. I mean, these Afro-Americans, Hispanic, white Americans. And, you know, I spoke with several of them and they all blamed Israel for this. None of them, not a single one. I mean, they said that this country, I mean, our taxpayers money. So the common man's feeling on the street in America is this, that Israel has overplayed its hand. It's actually relying on the American taxpayers money. It's exploiting, I think one or two of them mentioned APAC, you know, and they, they cursed Biden for being a very weak president. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, the senators, the congressmen and the heads of the state will react in a different fashion. But even on the Twitter there's several mainstream Americans and Europeans are basically saying that Israel has actually played its hand. So Israel cannot play victim. It's, of course, trying very well to play a victim over here. Mm -hmm. Had it been there, a loss of life or a building would have been destroyed or Israeli infrastructure okay. would have been destroyed. You see, and I think there is a there is a caution on part of the, uh, the American administration, the Biden administration, by saying that we will basically discuss with our G7 countries. Um, uh, by the way, we forgot to mention, I mean, before I go into the G7 thing, that uh, Israeli, uh, on the request of the Israeli ambassador, a session of the United Nations Security Council has been called at 4 p.m. Right. Now, the session is important because, of course, the United States, France, and uh, France and uh, you know UK are going to support uh, Israel. We have to see how many other countries basically support Israel. They might actually condemn, and they also, you see, because Russia and China are not going to support. And before this, uh, sending this barrage of 200-plus projectiles, uh, in these, uh, you know, shells into into Israel proper, mm. uh, Russia and China must have been con must have been consulted, mm. because you see, it, it, Iran hasn't really uh, 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 worked in a trigger happy fashion. It hadn't done a knee jerk reaction. First April, and this is thirteenth April. So in between the twelve days, they have consulted all the potential allies. You know, so I mean, I'm sure that China and Russia were taken on board before doing whatever they've done, and now it's time for China and Russia. So let's wait for the next few hours and see what kind of position so emerges. Really, um, if we think about it, the fact that UNSC, we expect that they'll nothing will come out of it. In essence, right? The United States, the United Kingdom, France, maybe one or two others might side with Israel. China and Russia, we think, will side against or abstain. So therefore, nothing will come of it. So in essence, we've gone back to the status quo on all the UN security resolutions on Israel as well, or the one after Damascus happened, or the one after the Iranian consulate in Damascus was attacked. 
And do you think that bring about I, the end of this this particular tip for tap uh, that's happening between the uh, two countries? Uh, because according me, me, to the Iranians, uh, they issued a tweet uh, by the permanent representative of the United Nations, um, who said that they concluded this matter in essence. You see, uh, don't end this discussion because there's so many different uh, variables to it. So, first of all, let me remind you that a few weeks ago, uh, Iranian Revolutionary Guards struck a missile inside Pakistani Balochistan, killing some Iranian dissidents, some women and children, two or three people, five people perhaps, you know. And um, Pakistani foreign minister, Pakistan reacted very badly. First, Pakistan remained quiet for 24 hours, but then there was a lot of reaction. Mm -hmm. And the Pakistani, um, there was a meeting of the National Security Co Council or Committee, and the Pakistani foreign minister who was in Sudan, Kampala somewhere, uh, called on the, uh, the in fact, the, the Iranian foreign minister called the Pakistani foreign minister to apologize for what happened, to explain what happened. Mm -hmm. And my understanding is this, uh, since then, from two different sources, that Pakistani side made it clear to the Iranian side that you have done this mistake, and we reserve the right to strike back, and you must accept. So the counter-Pakistani strike between two countries was, in fact, a sort of a consensus strike. So Tehran and Islamabad had a consensus that Islamabad will choose a place and strike. Iranians knew where they are striking. They struck at a compound uh, which had some Pakistani Baloch dissidents that were supposedly working against Pakistan. The moment this attack took place, uh, the Iranian Minister of Interior said that, you know, there's no Iranian loss of life and the matter was considered over. And the Iranian foreign minister subsequently also came to Pakistan, Hanki Lori. Iran's president is about to visit Pakistan. So uh, now subsequently, uh, we met some Iranian uh, experts and dissidents uh, in Washington uh, at the time. And they said that Iranian Revolutionary Guards have been doing these kind of missile and rocket strikes inside Pakistani Balochistan previously as well. Uh, but they had not declared it. They never declared it, and the Pakistani side ignored it. This time, the problem was that they were under pressure and they ended up declaring that they have done it. So the Pakistanis, once they had declared, it became an embarrassing point for the Pakistani side, and they had they they responded to it. Now, this is an internationally acceptable. Now, take the other example as well, that um, the Indians struck in Balakot uh, in 2019, in, uh, in, in 26th of February 2019, uh, and they said that the Pulwama attack, you know, happened because of Pakistani jihadis or whatever, and we're going to attack our madrasa. My understanding from that day to this point is, though the Indians said that they've killed 350 people, Pakistani side, no, nothing, nothing died, and Indians had missed the targets. My understanding was this, that uh, Indians are fully capable of hitting the madrasa. They didn't want to, the Air Force didn't want to hit the madrasa. They didn't want to kill the children. They didn't want to give Pakistan an active cause. So subsequently, uh, but they kept on declaring to the Indian public and Indian media that we have killed 350 people and so on. Pakistanis also demonstrated their capability. Uh, you know, uh, they, reserved, they did a counter strike in the Indian occupied Jammu and Kashmir. They picked up locked six targets very close to the Indian, uh, you know, the headquarters in Jammu and Kashmir, but didn't shoot at the Indian uh, assets or the Indian military or the Indian headquarters. And they basically had the point. Ha at that time, if the Indian uh, MiG pilot uh, Abhinandan uh, would not have uh, would not have been captured by the Pakistanis. Things would have ended then and there. You see, the Indians would have condemned it, issued statements. Pakistanis would have said, you know, we had the right to reserve. Abhinandan's, uh, you know, capture by the Pakistanis added new dimension to the situation. Iran has also conveyed via Oman and other countries and perhaps other sources to United States that it doesn't want an escalation. Uh, this was this was in the news. Right. Uh, and it expects the United States to basically hold on to Israel. Israel would like definitely the escalation. Now, it depends upon within the next 24 hours how the United States basically, because, because all other countries are just phony countries. I mean, none of the country has any independent foreign policy on Middle East. I mean, France, Pygmy, UK, Pygmy, Germany, Pygmy, none of them has any foreign policy. Canada stands nowhere. Australia, New Zealand, nothing matters. So how will Washington respond to it? Will Washington back up Israel uh, for, for further Don't strikes? Don't you feel Israel has to do something to show that it, it's still the strong strong country in the region? Not without Washington's blessing. You see, Israel 
because Israel will also come into, under pressure. You know, Israel has a very robust public opinion. They can also see that Netanyahu is playing. Uh, they are intelligent people. Uh, they can see what Netanyahu is playing up to. And if you also look at the letter which the Israeli uh, ambassador has written to the Security Council president, the letter basically says that Iran has been doing all this thing. And, you know, this is time for the Iranian Revolutionary Guard to be declared as a terrorist organization. They're not basically saying that it's time to, it's time to basically, uh, you know, sanction some war against Iran or something like this. And the United States so far has said that it will talk to the G7 countries and, and the allies to come up with a unified diplomatic response. So what is a unified diplomatic response? Censure of Iran, maybe declaring uh, Iranian Revolutionary Guards as a terrorist organization, applying more sanctions on them uh, and things like this. Then there's another point. They're not the point going to this... come to a unified diplomatic response from the United Nations, at least, right? So this unified, I'm not sure where this unified diplomatic response is going to no, 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 no. The unified response will be come from G7 countries. But within the G7 countries, also consensus will be a bit difficult mm -hmm. because G7 countries has Italy, the G7 countries has Japan, it has Germany, it has France, it has UK. So while UK will definitely stand by United States, I no, mean, France in G7 countries, France... France will as well on, on the um, Damascus issue, France voted with the United States and the UK. No, no, it... it, it um, in the it, United it, Nations. No, no, it will vote with them. But when it comes to a unified diplomatic stand, what happens behind the scenes will, is never never truly known. Mm -hmm. So the, the unified diplomatic stand might not be very strong because Italy, Japan, and France might differ from the position Israel, United States, and uh, uh, and UK might like to take. But the United Nations Security Council, of course, no consensus will develop because uh, once the Americans, the British and the Israelis will want that, you know, Islamic Revolutionary Guard should actually be declared terrorist organization, Russia and, and, and China are not going to basically play ball by that. Uh, but there's another thing that's going to happen. You know, as a result of all this, Israel that has become a victim at the level of the, so it has become a demon uh, as a result of the uh, the war in Gaza, uh, Israel is the the demon in eyes of the you know United Nations, right? So over here, Israel will also get the sympathy factor. I mean, Israel will become the victim, as you said. I mean, that one one psychological dimension is also there. No, this is what I was mentioning. That this is why a lot of people are criticizing um, Iran for doing what it did. Uh, just you know, very interesting. Uh, no, Iran had no option. You see, the point is this: this is like Pakistan had no option. Mm. After after the strike in the Balakot, mm. Pakistan had no option. And similarly, after the Iranian strike in no, Pakistan... But they did like have an option. I, I, I'm not sure I agree with it because... Uh, let me read a quote. I found a very interesting quote, which um, someone tweeted. And it's apparently Napoleon said this. Never interrupt your enemy when he's making a mistake. So the, re the thing is that Israel was in the middle of making a mistake. Israel was doing what it was doing. It was seen as the aggressor. Um, terms like genocide were being used for Israel. Iranians could have explained to their population and said, Israel is deliberately baiting us because it wants to spread the war and we're not going to fall for it. If the Iranians said that straight away after the 1st of April, I think they didn't have to do this. I mean, I, I think I, I personally believe that this is the tactic that they should have taken because they should have kept the focus on Palestine and not given Israel that maneuverability, which it now has, to say I'm a victim and this is why you need to help me because I'm in a bad, I'm in a bad, in a bad neighborhood and people can. Uh, th Najma, th theoretically, yes, it makes sense. Also, the fears that uh, what the counter strike from Israel could be, theoretically, it makes sense. But Iran is the Muslim power leader of the Arab street, of the Palestinians, of the Iranian public, and Iranian regime is very troubled, very unpopular at home. It has a lot of dissident voices. So Iran taking this, that it once it was very clear that uh, that Israel has done that, uh, has attacked the Iranian soil. It was an attack on Iranian sovereignty. For Iran to accept this uh, would have other implications and consequences for Iran's overall uh, projection across the Arab Street. Now Iran is bracing for maybe the counter strikes from Israel. So Iran will take the counter strikes, but the the message will go all across the Muslim world. And the message is already gone. That if there is one masculine character, if there is one bold character, if there's one genuine leader of the Muslim world... Let's not give it gender dynamics. Let's say... Bold well, I mean, gender gender dynamics are become very important part of the you know literature. Even the plugs are called male and female in this country. 
So I think the Iran has sent a message that it is uh, it is the bold country. It is the leader, basically. I mean, let's forget about the leader of the Muslim world. world. Yes, leader of the Muslim world. We thank you for your thoughts. We'll find out what's going to happen in the next 24 hours. But thank you for giving me your time. Thank you.